welcome to Bethel Church Sunday School Theater. Our regular service will start in a few minutes. However, first, we have a delightful story for you, acted and narrated by our very own Sunday School team. So without further ado, let's sit back and relax and enjoy a wonderful story. Good morning. My name is Benny. I know that sounds bad, but that's me. So, today's story is found in Genesis 29. In it, Jacob meets his match, a guy who knows how to cook up a few schemes of his own. There are five characters in this story, so I think we should introduce them to you. First, we have Jacob and his brother Esau. They argued, but you know, they are brothers. Next, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of young ladies because even though it's about a schemer, it's a love story too. So first up is Rachel and her sister Leah. Rachel and Leah are both important to Jacob. And last but not least, we have Laban. Laban is Rachel and Leah's dad. And he is a schemer. Okay. When we last saw Jacob, he was running for his life, trying desperately to get away from his brother Esau. That's because Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright. Hey, get back here, you schemer! Uh-oh, time to scram! After a very long journey, Jacob arrived at a well. There were some shepherds there waiting to feed their sheep. Hey guys, anybody know my Uncle Laban? Oh yeah, that's Rachel, his daughter! Jacob's heart began to pound. He was in love. Jacob introduced himself to Rachel, and she ran home to tell her father Laban that they had company. Laban was thrilled. Jacob was invited to live with them, and he began to help out with the family business. Jacob was a hard worker, and after a while, Laban asked him how he would like to be paid. As usual, Jacob had a plan. He offered to work for free if he could marry Rachel at the end of seven years. It's a deal, said Laban. So Jacob worked for seven long years in order to marry Rachel. Of course, to him, it seemed like seven days because, well, he was in love. On the day of the wedding, Laban invited everyone to a big party where he gave his daughter, wearing a beautiful gown with a veil that covered her face, to Jacob. The next day, Jacob was shocked to discover that his uncle Laban had tricked him. Instead of marrying Rachel, he had married her older sister, Leah. And that's when Laban decided to tell Jacob a little bit about a family tradition. The oldest girl has to get married first. You can still marry Rachel, he said. You'll just need to work for free for seven more years. So, Jacob the schemer was out schemed by another schemer, his uncle Laban. But as always, God is in charge of the world. And he continued to bless Jacob, although Jacob did have to work for another seven years. He did get to marry Rachel, the girl of his dreams. God also gave him more than 12 children, including a son they called the Dreamer. But more about him next week. Today's scripture reading is uh, Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. 
But before we read God's word, let's come to him in prayer. Sacred Jesus, you sent the Holy Spirit to your disciples so that they would have a helper and a guide at all times. We pray that you send us your Holy Spirit to be our helper. May your spirit pour light into our hearts and make our spirits glow in your glory. We seek to understand and stay in your word, O Lord. Illuminate our hearts with your spirit. Amen. The cost of being a disciple. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry, does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, the person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go, go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able, with 10,000 men, to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is a still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. There were squirrels in my attic. It was a few summers ago. I heard them in the corner of the ceiling at the top of my stairs. Scritch, scritch, scritch. Gnawing and chewing. On what? I didn't know. To get into my attic, there's a little trap door in the ceiling, and I wasn't brave enough to open up the trap door and look in. Because I had visions of angry rodents hurtling towards me with their yellow incisors mashing. So I did what maybe most of you all would have done. I called a guy. And he dutifully arrived later that week and said, yeah, squirrels, that's what's up there. Not a lot, not an infestation, but more than zero is too many squirrels on the roof, the roof line, how the squirrels were getting in, and he said this is definitely the sort of thing that I'd want to get fixed right away. Because once you have some squirrels in your attic, the word might get out to other squirrels that there's a great rent-free apartment that they can all stay in, and the scritch, scritch, scritch would get louder and more damaging. Apparently, if you have a scurry of squirrels, and that's what a group of squirrels is called, a scurry, if you leave them alone and, and don't remove them, they can chew right through your joists, right through your walls, and they can actually weaken the very structure of your house. So the pest removal guy who came, he recommended a course of action that would not only remove the squirrels without killing them, but would seal the place off so no more squirrels could get in. And then he gave me a quote, and I winced. Getting rid of the squirrels and keeping them out was going to be a costly thing. But he said the time was now, you got to do this now, because it's coming up to the time where the squirrels are going to have baby squirrels, and if you lock mom and dad out of the house while their babies are in the house, the squirrels get kind of crazy. They want to get back in. And those little yellow gnashing teeth can really start to wreck the place in their desperation to get in. Squirrels love their children. And so do we. Or if you don't have children of your own, you certainly know something of the power of the bonds of family, right? For a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, or for who is as close as family. It's about as potent a thing as you can imagine. 
And so maybe Jesus' words from Luke this morning made you wince, too. If you don't hate your father and mother, your spouse and your kids, your brother, your sister, or even your own life, you can't be my disciple. This is the gospel. Supposedly good news. For the big crowd that Luke says was following Jesus, it probably wasn't what they were expecting. Because up until this point in the Gospel of Luke, a lot of what Jesus is doing seems like dinner parties, healings, attracting a crowd for all the right reasons. But the caravan is moving closer to Jerusalem. And the mood changes. And things start to sound a little grim. Hate your family and even your own life. Carry your cross. Give away everything that you have. Consider the cost. Then, then you can be my disciple. And make sure you're really ready to do it before you even set out. There is no half measures here. You don't just build a tower halfway. So much for healings and so much for dinner parties, right? So much for big crowds, too. We often think that big crowds are a marker of success, and I think we think that in church circles especially. Our leadership conferences are full of people who pastor multi-site churches, and, and, and our people leave our churches, people leave smaller churches for larger churches all the time. And, and, and big crowds definitely do offer a thrilling experience. But in this reading from Luke, it almost seems like Jesus is trying to winnow to pare it down, to prune it like that rangy hedge you've got growing in your backyard. And, and, and if you know how the story goes from here, further on into Luke, you know that the crowd is going to dwindle. And by the time we, we, we hear of Jesus and what he does on that night in the Passover in Jerusalem, not even his closest disciples will admit that they know him. And so I wonder about crowds. Of course, they can be an indication that things are going really well. But maybe the sort of Christianity that attracts a big crowd, that attracts the throngs, is maybe just kind of Christianish. It has a Jesus-y kind of flavor. It sounds disciplish. But it doesn't sound like this. And if you look closer with a shrewd eye, you might see that it sounds like it's more about us sometimes than it is about the one who calls us to be a disciple. Right now, it seems that so much of what passes for Christianity is a kind of moralistic, therapeutic, consumerist kind of thing. As if being a disciple is about having the right connection, the right hookup to fulfill your own needs. That being a disciple is about being good. That being a disciple is about self-improvement. That being a disciple is about having a book that you can open and flip to the page that will answer all your questions. That Sunday morning service is kind of like a spa, a place to recharge. Being a disciple can sound sometimes like the thing that brings your life together and makes it look like every other middle-class life in Canada. And you know, none of those things are terrible. Being good and, and self-improvement, those are, those are good things, actually. But they seem so different than Christ crucified for the life of the world. They seem kind of casual, kind of easy, soothing. I remember years back uh, trying to explain to an office mate at Laurier uh, what it was like being a Christian. And she said to me, oh, that must be so comforting for you. And I thought, I guess comfort has something to do with it. There is that whole question and answer one in the Heidelberg Catechism. 
But I thought maybe I didn't explain it so well. Because being a Christian also seems to demand that I put a question mark after everything that I hold dear, including my own flesh and blood. So let's talk about this. Hating your family. It's really hard right now to hear the word hate in any way that's not the emotionally charged version of it that seems to preoccupy cable news. Hate makes you think of neo-Nazis marching on Charlottesville, right? It makes you think of incels on internet forums. It makes you think of politicians who stoke the fear of outsiders and immigrants. And then this morning you hear Jesus use that word too and you think, oh no, not you too. So does Jesus want you to hate your family? No. And I can say that with confidence because I haven't just read this chapter in Luke. I've also read the whole thing. And in Luke chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus says, honor your father and mother. So when Jesus says hate, he doesn't mean loathe or treat as repulsive. Hate is an old Jewish idiom. You can find it throughout the Hebrew part of the Bible in the Old Testament. Think of the way that Jacob's relationship with his wives is described in Genesis. Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. And the scriptures say he hated Leah. Hate here in Luke and throughout the Bible has more to do with a primary allegiance, a primary love, than it does with, with the emotional reaction of finding someone loathsome. Jesus is trying to say to the crowd, if you want to follow me, you can't do it half-heartedly. You can't be a part-time disciple. It's not a part-time job. You can't be a part-time disciple of Jesus and be a part-time disciple of someone else. Jesus comes first. Even still... Maybe hate isn't as harsh a term as we might think when we first read this, but we might want to still kind of take out our red pen and, and edit the text a little bit and soften it, right? Because it does show us how costly a shift in our lives can be. A couple of years ago, I was sitting in my office at the University of Waterloo and talking with a young Muslim woman who was starting to think that Jesus was calling her to be a disciple. And she was kind of anxious about this because she was wondering how she could possibly tell her family. And she wasn't afraid of, 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 of an honor killing or, or some of those kind of lures. She just knew how disappointed her family would be. Maybe you know stories like this. Of people who have become Christians later in their lives and their families think, Oh, that's quaint. Or their families think, oh, that's kind of stupid. And maybe those stories aren't our stories. Uh, faith is a family affair for a lot of us. But even we might know some of the friction and some of the awkwardness of having our own family members leave the faith. Or, or even follow to some conclusion, to some vocation that we find kind of upsetting. Jesus can get in the way of our family relationships. Hate your family means a shift in allegiance. And it's not so easy. What about this carry the cross business? I think it's easy to handle this one kind of poorly too, just like we handle the hate line poorly. Maybe you know what I mean. We've all got those things that annoy us, right? We've each got our own sort of list. The pain in the hip, the annoying neighbor, the boss that's on our back all the time, the debt we've got that's gonna take forever to pay off. And we say, well, that's just the cross that I need to bear. But the crowd that was following Jesus, they wouldn't have been so glib with the language of the cross. 
They knew what a crucifixion was. And they knew that it was something more onerous than having a debt or having a boss that won't leave you alone. They would have said, carry my cross. Willingly? You mean the thing that I'm going to be hung on and die naked on in front of everybody? Carry your cross isn't a call to endure some pain in the neck. It's a call to die. Christianity is a call to die. And countless martyrs have shown us this. And and though actual martyrdom might be a long way from our own relatively safe and secure lives, I think there's plenty of crucifying that we can do. Death to our egos. Death to our little vanity projects. Death to all those idols that lure us in day after day. Death to faith to faith as a hobby. Death to faith as Sunday morning recreation. After a call to die and a call to hate, Jesus' next his final instruction, give away all your possessions, might actually sound not as bad. But it's cut from the same fabric. The call to discipleship is a call to empty ourselves of all the things that we think we need to hold on to tight and hold dear. Sacrifice is at the very core of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a disciple. And I know this makes middle class people uncomfortable. It makes this middle class person uncomfortable anyways. And maybe it does mean that our money has got to go. And certainly there have been saints throughout the century who have been very literal in their application of this, from St. Anthony of the Desert all the way to Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Christianity. What other group tells its prospective members, hey, come join us, and by the way, you've got too much money in your pocket. But I don't think it's just possessions. I don't think it's just money. Think of the stuff we hang on to. Maybe you've got a garage that is full of pride. So jammed with pride that you can't get your car in there. Or maybe you have a closet at home and you know it's kind of risky to open it because it's so crammed with anger that it might all come tumbling out if you open the door too quickly. But then, when everyone else leaves the house, you open it a crack anyway, because you like to pick through it all, to stroke those old resentments like some keepsake. Or maybe you've got a room in the basement where there's this like big, dusty pile of worry. And you know that the anxious life is not a good life but you keep all that stuff down there anyways because it just kind of feels safe to have it there. Or maybe up in the attic, you've got some things that you wouldn't dare tell anyone about and you hope they stay up there. But at night when you lay awake in bed, you can hear it scritch, scritch, scritch. The treasures that we hang on to, the things that we think we need to clutch onto tightly, they can start to define our lives. Whether it's actual treasure, whether it's our bank accounts, whether it's the most seductive new little gadget, or whether it's the anger or the pride or the anxiety or whatever. We start to love those things because we think they keep us safe and secure. They become who we are in a way. But if that's the case, here's the good news about following Jesus. He will set you free of all the things that you drag through life. So maybe Jesus' words aren't so onerous and heavy-handed after all. 
We are so prone to scrambling after our own security that we might miss the whole point of discipleship in the first place, that it will bring us closer to our Creator, who says to us that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus' words are not the harsh commands of a drill sergeant. They're the words of someone who knows his creatures and knows how jammed their lives are with unnecessary baggage. And so he says to us this morning, you are trying to fill up your lives with all this stuff when I am the one thing that is needed. When I am the true vine that nourishes all the branches. When I am the, the bread that fills the hungriest belly. When I am the one who gives you living water that you will drink and thirst no more. That I am the one who has paid the cost to make all of that possible. I am. I am. I think we can reflect all morning on the cost of being a disciple, as Luke tells us this morning, and maybe still miss out on the point entirely. We can turn it into a kind of macho Christianity, a chest-thumping kind of Christianity that says, look what I can deprive myself of. Look what relationships I can sacrifice for Jesus. Look what I have given away. And you know, you can give all your money away and still be a self-righteous jerk about it. And think, oh, I can't hang out with those other Christians, those decadent Christians, because they don't get it. And that's just a graceless, damnable thing. But Jesus' words are not graceless. In fact, that's the very way they hit our ears and move into our hearts. All of this sacrifice, all of these harsh words, seemingly harsh words from Luke, they're a down payment on a life that's aimed towards its true purpose, communion with the one who is making all things new. One of my favorite people in the entire world is a man named Jürgen Norbert Klopp. He's a tall German man with a long German name. I actually don't know him personally. He's the manager, uh, the coach of Liverpool Football Club, which is a soccer team that is very dear to my heart. And I always told myself I would never use a sports analogy in a sermon, but here we go. New things, right? Jurgen Klopp is famous for being a demanding manager. If you want to play for Jurgen's team, you better be prepared to empty the tank, to run until your legs are worn down. And if you don't want to do that, well, there are a lot of other clubs you could play for. But players love him. They don't fear him. They often talk about him as more than a coach. They talk about him as a father figure, and they go to him with problems on the pitch and problems off the pitch. His hugs for his players and for players in the opposing team are legendary. And right now, Liverpool has a great Brazilian striker named Roberto Firmino. He's one of these players who works and grafts and toils, but somehow makes the game look like a dance. And a little while ago, he heard that the club was interested in signing another Brazilian, another one of his countrymen. And he sent him a text message and he said, come play for Jurgen. Come play for Jurgen. He is so demanding, but he will make you so much better. My sisters and brothers, a call to discipleship is a costly one. It's a call to die, a call to give it all away. But the call to discipleship is a graceful one too. Because it comes from the one who says, follow me. Follow me because I love you. I love you. And my love changes the world. My love won't just make you better. My love will make you a new creation.
And you know, deep down, on the surface, we like a comfortable life. But deep down, intuitively, we know how sacrifice and how self-giving can make us love deeply and richly. We know this, don't we? We know there's a richer life to be found when we move past our own self-interest and move towards the interest of others. You can see it in the small things, right? Sacrificing a Saturday morning to take your kid to that pre-dawn hockey practice. And you can see it in the big things, too. Spending your days with your aging parent as they slip into dementia. Or sitting on the couch next to your grieving friend in that painful, awkward silence where you don't know exactly what to say, you don't have the magic words, but your presence is what makes all the difference anyway. That kind of sacrificial love is tender and gentle. And it teaches us something about the way Jesus loves us. So as we hear the call to discipleship this morning, as we hear about the cost of discipleship, may it be ever enclosed, surrounded by the kind of love that Jesus has for us. May that love shape the love that we have for each other. For our mothers and fathers and spouses and siblings and friends. May it sustain us as we walk that joyous, demanding, costly, graceful road of, of discipleship. May it make us whole. Restore us to the kind of creatures we were created to be. Those squirrels haven't come back. The man with the ladders and the wire fencing, he saw to it because he saw it all the way through. No half measures. And so my house, it stands with integrity now. Its structure is sound, just like the great architect designed it to be. It was costly. But a bit of, would have been way costlier if I'd done nothing. My sisters and brothers, may we respond to the call of our Savior with love and with joy. He is demanding but he will make you into a new creation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. Our generous God, our graceful God, we confess that we are people who like lives of comfort. We are accustomed to that kind of life. And so when we hear words from your gospel this morning, they can sound kind of harsh. May we remember that your words to us are surrounded by mercy and grace and love. That your call to us to follow you is a call to be loved by you, and to be changed by you. May we know that you are the one who paid the cost to made all, make all of that possible. And may our praise for you be ever on our lips. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing.
sisters and brothers, the spirit who called us together in worship this morning is the spirit that now sends us back out into the world. And just as Jesus said to those disciples on the way to Jerusalem, he says the same things to us this morning. Come follow me. And that's a graceful call. And he sends us out with the grace of this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. 